Will the company be rebranding back to Impact Wrestling? And is Impact Zone Canada not too far off in the horizon? This is BQ when I do this for the Impact Wrestling fans. Well, how about instead of focusing on those yahoos, you focus yourself on Eli Drake? Hey folks, welcome to the Impact Roundup brought to you by Pro Wrestling Tees. Limited edition King of the Mountain Pro Wrestling Tees are still available. Make sure you get them before they are all gone and we are in full rebrand mode. The link can be found in the description of this video. According to Dave Meltzer and the Wrestling Observer. Are you calling me a liar? Everybody appears to be on board with a rebranding from Global Force Wrestling back to Impact Wrestling despite some initial hesitance from those within the company. Yes, the merger or maybe I should say no, the merger was never fully complete, and Double J does still own the name to Global Force Wrestling. It's been further stated that while the company has publicly expressed that Jeff will be back, no one actually knows for sure. It's rumored that the ultimate goal now is to base Impact Wrestling out of Canada. What do you guys think of that? What do you think of that happened? They feel like they're always going to be associated with the TNA name as long as they are in the impact zone at Universal Studios. Fair assessment. You can call it whatever you want. You can change the color of the ropes. You can change the bells and whistles, the announcers, the wrestlers. You can make a lot of changes, but it's always going to feel like TNA. And I can understand they want to get away from that. Now Meltzer, make sure to let us know that the Aberdeen Pavilion is not an arena. Dummy! Yeah. Well, yes, Ed Norholm has already made that perfectly clear that he wanted an intimate setting and wasn't going to try and fill an arena. Now, he said that the goal was to have 500 people at night. I understood that as 500 a night for the tapings. I would imagine Bound for Glory could draw more than 500 considering when it was held in Charlotte a couple years ago, they, they pulled 500 paying customers. Um, and I know they comped, they comped a lot on top of that. He basically stated that he wanted an intimate atmosphere where the fans and wrestlers could interact. So Meltzer is right that the venue does hold 2,800 people and that it's flat so that they would have to bring in bleachers, which is not difficult, Dave. There's no dressing rooms and just a few bathrooms. He's, he's letting us know. So it's really, really going to be interesting how they pull all this off. Listen, Dave. The impact zone doesn't have dressing rooms. I don't even know that they have bathrooms back there either. They're called pods. We get them overseas on deployments too. They set up pods that we live in or that we shower in or that we go to the bathroom in. Now granted, these are extra expenses that they don't normally have to, you know, companies shouldn't have to worry about when they're choosing a venue, but that is the situation. But it is not difficult to create a backstage area and dressing room for the talent. I find it strange that some people want to attack them for choice of venue considering that there's really only only one company who does actually wrestle in arenas. And as much as we love Impact, you know, it's basically become an indie promotion on steroids. But how many times have you gone to indie shows where they're inside gyms, VFWs, hockey rinks? Uh, God, I could let's go on and on of where you would put an independent wrestling show. So why why is it okay with them? I grant now granted this is a much bigger company than an independent wrestling show, but you know, let's come on. Aberdeen Pavilion, very old building, but very nice building, and I think they're going to do some really good things with it. Look at the impact zone that they created in India. Dave, Dave Meltzer. Are we going to slam them for being realistic? Or are we going to slam them for being unrealistic? What's it going to be, Dave? And not just Dave, but everybody else. We're going to get on social media and, oh, they only want to draw this many people and they want to be in a small arena. But what happens if they try to get... God, I can't remember. I think they changed the name. The Air Canada Center that Toronto Raptors play in. What if they try to do that? Same people, oh, they're trying to fill this arena. They're trying to get this many. You know, mm, 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 mm. Let's move on from that. Now, uh, the article I was reading, reading about the Aberdeen Pavilion is that it holds 2,800 people. So Dave is right on that. Kind of did some math here. 
Um, let let's just say that the average fan ticket is thirty dollars because they're they're gonna they're gonna range in price. And you know, there's gonna be VIP packages and all that. But let's just say the average is three hundred, and they do get five hundred people a night, including Bound for Glory. Um, have done the math, and at the end of the setting taping set of tapings, that would be a gross gross revenue of ninety thousand dollars. To rent out the Aberdeen Pavilion all day, which they're going to have to rent it out all day, is uh, ooh, I don't remember. It's seven thousand seventy seven hundred dollars a day. So that per day for, throughout the tapings is going to be roughly forty thousand dollars. You do the math, and the net profit ends up about fifty thousand fifty one thousand dollars. That doesn't include any upsells or merchandise, obviously. So it's not going to be you know something that appears to be highly profitable. Um, but of course, you know, because there's going to be travel expenses and everything that they need to fit into that. Um, the X factor is going to be the global force network or the global wrestling network. I'm sorry. How is that going to factor in? How are pay-per-view sales going to factor in? And obviously, like I said, the upsells and the merchandise. Now, apparently there are financial advantages to doing events in Canada. And I know some of my listeners are Canadian and you can hit me up directly and kind of explain that to me and then I can uh, put it back out on the channel. I tried to do my due research on it, but it wasn't something I really felt comfortable speaking on at this point. But there's supposed to be financial advantages. But um, there was this one website that I read that already um, has said that the global network uh, was going to fail. Um, because only, only WWE has a, a successful network. And I guess, so with the global network, they're not trying to make it a Impact Wrestling app. It's more of like a uh, Fight TV app, or it's an Anthem app. It's not really associated with that company per se, even though they're going to have a lot of the content on it, but it's going to be about getting um, companies from all over. And this same... This same uh, the same article saying, well, Pro Wrestling Tote Noah isn't that popular in the United States and um, Crash and AAA aren't part popular in the United States. Like, just just know-it-alls, you know. Um, of course, something is not going to be super popular if it's not available to them. So, screw the dirt sheets. Let's see what they do with this. The same article says, it remains to be seen if they can pull a TV-worthy crowd in Canada. Just because these guys struggle in the United States does not mean you go to another country and you're just going to struggle there as well. A lot of the reason that the Impact Zone doesn't, you know, that that many people don't show up for the tapings because you see the pay per views, you get you they hit capacity, but you you get you get complacent when you get the same thing all the time. Like there's, I have indie promotions here locally. I, I don't go every single time because I know if I miss it one month, I'm going to go the next month. And we're we're as in the United States as a whole, we're very um, we're very spoiled. And I don't mean we're all a bunch of spoiled brats running around, but we're very spoiled. We have, you know, we, a lot of us live in states with multiple sports teams. Sometimes multiple teams who play the same sport. We have all sorts of college teams. We have amusement parks. We have we have all these things that other countries don't necessarily have. And when something special like Impact comes to Canada. It becomes must-see for those people. It's not must-see for the people in Orlando. And it's not a knock on them, but that's just how it is. If you're going to Canada to do the show and it's... We don't know when these guys are coming back. So let me put it like this. When I went to my first Impact Zone show in 2016, and that's after they um, tried to go on the road and to uh, Pennsylvania and all that. You know, I was talking to some people... You know, because we had a good crowd that night. And they said, well, we don't know when they're going to come back. And that that's how the impact, that, that was the um, the feeling in the impact zone that night. So trust me, you go to Canada and you do all these tapings and you don't show back up to the first quarter of uh, 2018. That impact zone is going to be much fuller because those people now don't know when they're coming back. Or they don't know if the next set of tapings is going to be uh, be there still or continue to be there because they know Canada and the UK are on the radar as well. So good things are happening. They're taking some chances. We don't know how profitable going to Canada is going to be with the travel expenses and all that. But I mean, 
hell, if you do Bound for Glory in Orlando, it's really not profitable at all, aside from the TV, the uh, pay-per-view buys and the um, VIP upsells. So what are you guys thinking right now? I know I've been talking for a long time here, but what are you guys thinking about Bound for Glory being Canada? Would you support the company going to Canada for good? Subscribe to the channel. This is BQ.